everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and with me, just staying through these internet problems that we're already facing, is the absolutely chaotic and sure to always be a good time, Mackenzie. Good time? Just a good time? A great time. A I'm a great time. time. It's not badminton. It's good minton. No, it's great minton. <laughs> okay, so just dishing out puns all day, I guess. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about two things. As always, we always talk about history and literature. So we're going to be talking specifically about the Hudson's Bay Company as seen through a branch of children's literature, uh, specifically known as boys' adventure literature. Or boyhood. Boys literature. Boyhood literature. Yeah. Wasn't Boyhood a movie? Boyhood was a movie that I still have not seen and so, that seemed to have kind of flown on the coattails that, hey, it was a movie filmed over 12 years and they that a cool gimmick. Just like having a quirk isn't a personality, having a gimmick gimmick isn't a movie. Exactly. Um, apparently, it was like a cool movie in its own right and like a really interesting movie. But from what I've heard, like a lot of people just focus on that one. Anyway, before we get started, obviously, you can always support the show through PayPal, through Patreon, where you can get access to extra episodes and early episodes, including uh, Pop Canada, which is led by Mac and is all about pop culture in Canada. And if you don't want to support us monetarily, that's okay too. You can always leave a five-star review and that helps boost the show and get it to more people's ears. So that's always very appreciated. So as always, as a kind of way to open us up to the discussion, we're going to start with the more historical aspect and then see how the literature plays into this. So, Mac, when we think of the Hudson's Bay Company, what comes to your mind uh, for the company in general, right? Well, the storefront for the most part. Yeah. We have a lot of Hudson's Bay, uh, like the blankets and everything in this house. We're a big Hudson's Bay family that way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And we've got exactly. like the metal tins that held the popcorn. We ate all the popcorn and now they're kind of little trash bins. I think we've got like one of their uh, canoe hat. We've got, we've got all sorts of stuff from Hudson's Bay Company. Right. So today, obviously, people know it more as a department store known as the Bay. More than La Bay else. in Quebec. Yes, I'm sorry. La Bay. Did you see the new language loss? God. <sighs> I know. So, uh, we're not going to get into it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll save that for when we get into the 70s. <laughs> like that'll, oh God. that'll be a fun episode. Anyway, the Hudson's Bay Company. It's now known as this large chain department store, but that aspect of it kind of happened in the 1860s. And for the longest time, from its creation in the 1670s all the way to right around Confederation era, it was actually one of the biggest landowners of Canada, right? Um, and we'll get into how that happened and what that meant for just Canada in general and just for what it means to, own, to, to be a company in Canada. But essentially, for a while, the Hudson's Bay Company, before being a department store, was a fur trading company that pretty much owned the land from what is modern-day Manitoba to British Columbia. So 90% of Canada up, was yeah. just private land. It was straight up bigger than most countries. Yeah. Yeah, and it was private. Insane. We'll see, obviously, that it wasn't as straightforward as that. For a while, it went through, well, what was basically competition with other fur trading companies. But as we'll see in the grand scheme of things, it didn't take particularly long before basically the Hudson's Bay Company had a monopoly, right? Which today Monopolies. is illegal. At the time, no one cared. It's like that time when you land on Park Place and you owe that other person like $800. That's the worst. Don't play Monopoly. Monopoly is just a bad board game in general. <laughs> what I always love to see with Monopoly, by the way, already just like complete tangent, is the kind of offshoots that exist of it that either poke fun at it or take Monopoly to a whole new level of extreme. There's Canadopoly. Okay. From Monopoly from Canadian Monopoly from A to Z. Incredible. I hate it. <laughs> We'll do it on an episode of Hot Canada one time. We'll just play through Canada Mop Can Can Canopoly. Can we'll put it onto Patreon. Hell yeah. <laughs> We're gonna ruin our friendship. Yay! Because that's all Monopoly does is ruin everything. Anyway. Just like in real life to segue us back. 
The Hudson's Bay Company, as it stands or as we understand it in a historical context, was established in 1670, not by the British, who would own the Hudson's Bay Company, but essentially by what were known as Canadian trappers, fur trappers, known as Pierre Esprit Radisson and Médard Chouard des Groseilliers. There were these two French or French Canadian hunters and trappers, mostly of beaver pelts, and they basically wanted to establish a network, a trading network, with other traders and with the indigenous population in and around what is now known as the Hudson's Bay, which is in the, if you want an idea of it, it's in the northern part of Quebec, right? If you look at Ontario and Quebec, that little bay that, ex or that big bay that exists to the north of those provinces, that's the Hudson's Bay. So basically, because there were, had already been traders that accessed through the St. Lawrence and through the, the Hudson River, more in what's today the United States, Radisson and Des Groseilliers wanted another access, right, a little bit more to the north, and basically uh, tap into an untapped market, right, or an untapped part of the market. Yeah, tap that market. Mm-hmm. And so they basically went to a couple of London financiers and said, yo, would you help us establish this trading network? Which basically means that they put up the money in order to finance Radisson and Groseillis and whatever uh, partners they would get, uh, finance their expeditions into Canada, and they would finance also the establishment mm -hmm. of outposts. So obviously they wouldn't have to go back and forth every day. So that's where you get the establishment of certain forts or just straight up trading posts, which would serve as kind of, uh, you know, just areas where you could stay for the night or areas where you could trade very uh, quickly. Almost immediately, right after its foundation in 1670, the British government would basically grant monopoly control of the fur trade to the Hudson's Bay Company over what is now known as Rupert's Land, which is essentially, as we were saying, anything including Manitoba to the west and to the north. In, at the time, it included some parts of north central uh, United States. It's the same way that, you know, there was one big Louisiana before, yeah. and then it all just got broken up and sold and bought and all that other stuff. Exactly. So basically, at this time, the Hudson's Bay Company had control over 3.9 million square kilometers. Right? As Max said, that's more than most countries today. Excluding Russia, it's pretty much bigger than every single country. Yeah. <laughs> Russia, maybe China and the US. Yeah. It's an ungodly amount of territory that is controlled by what is ostensibly a private company. I say I feel like we're going to be coming full circle with all that pretty soon. Huh. Give anyway. it 20 years and Jeff Bezos <laughs> is going to have Amazonia or something. But I mean, isn't it... Okay, this is already, again, a tangent. Wasn't it Elon Musk who wanted to finance, basically, space colonies? Uh, yep. Isn't that what he's actually just doing? Yeah. Which is a horrible <laughs> idea. Please don't go with it. I mean, it could be worse. I mean, considering that there would be pretty much no legislation in space because it's space, no. I, I think, like, there are a lot of things that could, like, go wrong. I don't know. Like, I'm just, I, you know, I don't know how much government has done to help. Yeah, no, I agree, but, like, anyway. Besides, everybody can be a pirate. <laughs> space pirates. We can all be space pirates. <laughs> Call me Captain Cooper. <laughs> so, despite the fact that uh, the Hudson's Bay Company had a monopoly over what we now know as Rupert's Land. There were still other companies, right? So there was what was known as the XY and the Northwest Companies, which mainly operated in the south uh, southeastern part of uh, Canada, so around the St. Lawrence Valley. If you want more information about the Northwest Company, you can listen to my very early episode on Sir Alexander Mackenzie, who was a mm -hmm. Scot. Germany. Yes, exactly. Uh, Sir Alexander Mackenzie, who was the first person or the first European person that we know of that traversed the breadth of the North American continent north of Mexico. So that's very cool. And he worked for the Northwest Company. Um, so basically, the Hudson's Bay Company had to deal with these two other companies in what I like to colloquially call hashtag free market is a bitch. So the HPC actually it would almost not survive basically the 17th century because the Northwest Companies 
and the XY company, the Northwest company and the XY company had a really solid stronghold through the St. Lawrence, right? It was a much more direct route and a much more established route into the continent than the Hudson's Bay route had ever been. Right. So for a while, it was a very, very difficult time for the HBC to actually establish itself. Right. What actually changed was that the XY company's leader, Simon McTavish, would die, which forced the XY company to merge with the Northwest company. Right. And that would lead to, a, lead to a bunch of internal strife within this newly merged company. Right. And essentially... Because of these internal strifes, it, it basically allowed for the Hudson's Bay Company to come in and just buy off the Northwest Company or this new Northwest Company for pretty much pennies, what was considered pennies for what it was really a lucrative trade at the time, mm -hmm. and say, okay, well, we'll just stop this right here. I'll take over everything. And in 1821, that's basically what happened. The Hudson's Bay Company merged with the Northwest Company, and it just all became part of the, the HBC, essentially cinching its ultimate monopoly on the Canadian fur trade. And this would continue <laughs> up until 1870. Right. And we'll see a bit later why in the in a different episode that leads up to Confederation. Why Everything we've been doing is just about leading up to Confederation at this point. We're trying to set up all the pieces that we can. Yeah, exactly. Which makes sense. And the HBC is like an indelible part of that. So in 1870, pretty much, um, well, I think I can mention it now because it's important for, I think, our understanding of the literary text later. But the HBC would essentially be bought by the Canadian government. Well, it's still going. It's just the yes. land that got bought. Yes, it's, it's, that's true. The land got bought. It's the oldest North American company, the Hudson's Bay Company. Actually, that's a pretty good segue into saying like, it's, it's weird that I've been alluding to the fact that, you know, the Hudson's Bay Company is a private enterprise, but yet the British government was intrinsically involved in its sale, for example, um, later to the Canadian government. So how does that work, right? If it's a private company, how can it be managed by the British government, right? How can it be such a tool of the empire? Well, dear friends, long story short, because we're not going to get into the, basically the nitty gritty of uh, corporate, um, corporate institutions, but basically because it was a company, it had shares that people could buy into and invest in basically much like a relatively modern company. And a lot of those shares were owned by the British government directly. So it was a private company nominally. In reality, it was owned almost entirely by the British government right? and uh, members of parliament. You'll see, if you want a, another example of something like this, it, you see that in the East India Company, right? Mm -hmm. Which did exactly the same thing in obviously mm -hmm. India and what would be called at the time Indochina, so Southeast Asia today. Basically, the British government, instead of officially taking over countries, would create these companies which would incite investment from their own members and from private enterprises into this company which would enable for the establishment of a British foothold in different countries including Canada and including India and pretty much everywhere. I think you saw something similar in South Africa for example. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was imperialism but by means of uh, private enterprise. That's basically what it was couched in. So that's what I mean when we say like, oh, how is the British government involved? Because it's basically the Hudson's Bay Company. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a company in name only. It's, it's Hudson's Bay Company is so quintessentially Canadian in a way. Okay, interesting. If I can say that, like, it's just one of those things, you know? Mm -hmm. if, I don't know if you agree with that statement or not. Um, but it's, yes. it's the same way that America almost is Walmart. Okay, interesting. You know okay. what I mean? Like, you think of a store that is like, that's the all-American store, and that's probably Walmart. Mm -hmm. I would almost take it in a different direction. I agree with you, but in a slightly different way, especially when we're considering in the era we're talking about. Do it. Right. Because I agree with you, uh, Trace, as to like, in, if we talk about Hudson's Bay Company today, right, post-1870, when it became like a department mm -hmm. store. At the time, I would compare the HBC to Manifest Destiny. 
okay. if you want to make like the American parallel here, right? Because a lot of the rhetoric around the HBC, and I think this is something that we can touch upon later with the Boyhood novels, is that it was going to eventually become part of Canada. It, that was almost immediately a plan. It, or it had been in discussions long before the 1870s. So it was being prepared. It was being groomed in a sense mm -hmm. to, um, to, 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 to accept the wave of huge air quotes civilization that Canada was bringing <laughs> with it, right? So, and the rhetoric of the time was very much based upon that, right? When people talked about the uh, Rupert's Land, right? Or the Hudson's Bay Company, it was almost inevitable that it would become part of Canada. Uh, in that sense. Uh, so that's why I compare it more to Manifest Destiny in so far as it's like, yeah, obviously it's going to become Canada. Obviously it's going to become something greater than this savage and untamed land that's good only for fur trade. Right? It's going to become so-called civilized. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with your statement that no matter which era you look at it, it's almost inevitable to talk about the Hudson's Bay Company. It, it's, you can't dissociate Hudson's Bay Company and Canada. No. It's, it's they an are, integral part. It is just one of those things, you know? And obviously, we can take this in a whole bunch of directions. You know, we often say, again, to bring it to the American parallel, we often say, like, oh, Americans are the much more capitalist country, and it's, uh, and it's you know, ho horribly uh, misled by its free market practices. But we have a great history of something like that also, right? It's, again, couched in what we like to call this, kind of <laughs> this Canadian, what was, yeah. what was it you said, the, the term you used, revisionism? Not, the point is, like, we, we tend to ignore the fact that we went through a similar process here. It was just couched in the British government. Government. With that being said, that was basically just an overview of what the Hudson's Bay Company was as, a, as an idea. I want to delve a bit more deeply into its phases, because I would argue that the Hudson's Bay Company kind of went through two of them, right? In the 17th right. and 18th centuries, in its initial uh, period, where it was very much struggling to establish itself, right? and in the 18th and 19th centuries, when it basically had established full control and all it could do was expand. Mm -hmm. right. So the 17th and 18th centuries, I think, is relatively straightforward where pretty much what it ended up doing was establishing trading outposts, mostly on the coasts. Right? It went very little into the actual mainland of Canada, not only because it was cold, but because there were very little rivers that you could actually go through for any extended period of time, much like the St. Lawrence you, uh, allowed you to. And also just because it wasn't particularly necessary at the start. Right? You could very well make a living uh, by trading with the indigenous populations that were on that East Coast, and they had their own trading routes on the inside. They had their own networks that would allow them to go get the fur trades or some voyageurs and traders, the Canadian traders also went with them, but mostly mm -hmm. it was indigenous populations that went on the mainland and brought back things on the coast and brought back beaver pelts, for example, to the coast. Um, and so you basically didn't need to go very deep. What I really find interesting, however, <laughs> with this period is that very rapidly you see the emergence of what is basically a monetary system. Right. So the HBC, I don't know if you knew this, had its own money right? Okay. that it established almost immediately. And it was called the Made Beaver, okay. which basically uh, it was a way of much like a, for a long time, not long after the establishment of the Hudson's Bay Company, right? For a long time, money was based on gold, right? The value of gold uh, mm -hmm. established the value of money or more or less what we call the gold standard. So similarly, the Hudson's Bay Company basically tied the value of their money, of their coin, to what a beaver was worth. <laughs> Which I think is so, it just perfectly encapsulates Canada for me to be like, yeah, of course we're going to base our money not on gold, but on beaver, <laughs> which well, I how, find so funny. Beaver fur was the way of the trade. It's how they traded yeah. with the First Nations people, you know? Exactly. And I you find would, that great. <laughs> what yeah. one gun for however tall a stack of beaver furs is to a gun. Yeah. And yeah. then over the years, guns would get longer and longer. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's inflation for you right there. <laughs> mm. 
basically the the coin much like most money is used to facilitate trade you often didn't have uh, access to lump sums of money or guns necessarily at your disposal so it would basically act as a stand-in for uh it was basically a promissory note as all money is right in in essence all money is a kind of form of debt or an iou so to speak um that stands in for x trade so yeah i just thought that was a really cool indication as to mm-hmm. how the hudson's bay company operated at this time on the coast and with immediately like a really uh we're not really complex but already establishing certain complex forms of bartering and economy that um uh, you know stay with us to this day although uh, obviously we don't we have free floating currency it's not as far as i know our currency isn't based yeah. on the value of beaver anymore <laughs> It's not damn. I mean, our, our, what is it? Our five cent uh, coin that has a beaver on it? That'd be kind of cool. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. Oh, no, never mind. I do. I do. I, I like, thought, what? I, I got confused with like five and 50 cent coin because I know oh. there used to be some of those in circulation. They still are. It's just no one uses them. No, on the 50 cent, uh, the queen appears and it's the coat of arms of Canada. Mm, yeah interesting a little off topic in terms of the actual management of the hudson's bay company you basically had as a kind of extension of what i was saying earlier you basically had a governor and committee which was based in london and was mostly just uh appointed or elected among the shareholders which were mostly the british government at an annual meeting right so there was an annual meeting of Uh, shareholders in the Hudson's Bay Company who invested in it and elected a governor and basically lieutenant governors that um, would manage the Hudson's Bay Company and its finances and where exactly it traded, etc., etc. Mostly they, actually for most of this period, for all of this period, uh, the governor actually never came to Canada, (laughs) which... Again, nothing new. That's just the way it it goes. Especially at this time when travel was extremely hard to Canada, you can be certain that no governor was actually going to come here (laughs) unless they already lived here or unless they were forced to. But for the Hudson's Bay Company, that was just (laughs) no. (laughs) So uh, during this time, actually, traders also received a salary, but they did not yet receive a share of the profits, right? So they would basically just get a wage. That's it. And no matter how much they actually traded or not, they did not yet receive a commission or a share. This is something that would actually change later. But in this initial period, it was like, we're hiring you to do this. And that's your task. Just do as usual with a lot of these colonies, there was basically no oversight or very little oversight. So it led to some problems, especially in terms of, uh, you know, what is owed to a certain person but you know by and large that was the name of the game in the early days in the pre-18th century days of the hudson's bay company Mm -hmm. with the 18th and 19th centuries this would kind of shift so this is when basically the hudson's bay company would start moving inland and expanding its network of power well, in reality, it did control most of Canada. That was a non-thing, really, when you considered the 17th uh, century, right? Because, mm-hmm. the, as again, they stayed on the coast. But with the 18th century, they actually did establish networks inside the country that forced, basically, the Hudson's Bay Company to create these much more complex systems uh, of management. So this is the period where you start to see regional divisions being made. So you had... Uh, basically the southern western uh, southern department which was more or less present day northern ontario and you had the northern department which was basically the prairie provinces and the northwest territories so everything Mm -hmm. else except ontario and both of them had a governor this would eventually change again but for most of the 18th and 19th centuries this is how it was In 1810, the traders themselves would actually start to receive a share of the Hudson's Bay Company profit, which was a way of inciting them to trade more and more, right? Because obviously, the more beaver pelts you traded, the more profit you made. Obviously, there's a whole lot that you can say about the nature of that system, right? And how it affected the environment, how it affected relations with indigenous populations, um, how it basically forced the 
acceleration of the fur trade and the, <laughs> ostensibly the expansion west of the Hudson's Bay Company and of Canada. Um, and we'll see if we get into that later. But for now, again, I'm just kind of overviewing it. There's two last points that I want to mention about the Hudson's Bay Company that kind of sum up what I'm talking about here. There's a really famous governor during this period that was named Sir George Simpson. And Sir George Simpson, for me, encapsulates this idea of expansion of the Rupert's Land Territory and you know, just the general management of the Hudson's Bay Company in this time. So basically under his supervision as governor, he would basically merge a Hudson's Bay company into one big monolith and he would expand Rupert's land into uh, what is modern day BC. At the time it was called New Caledonia. Now British Columbia itself would become a colony on its own in 1858, but we're going to have a whole episode on that, which is basically gold rush in British Columbia, sorry, how that created the modern day BC or helped instigate the modern day BC. So Sir George Simpson for me, and we can talk a bit about him later, but he would basically solidify uh, the Hudson's Bay Company and Rupert's Land into its final form, so to speak, its highest peak, which to me is kind of insane. In this case, one man's ability to control such a large territory of land that he can just executively make that decision, right? That he can just, without much of a thought, um, say, hey, suddenly we're taking part of this colony also as part of our private enterprise, which is just mind boggling to me, right? That this person who <laughs> never went to Canada, uh, I don't think he ever went to Canada, uh, I'm not sure, just can just arbitrarily decide that, hey, now this is private land, which is basically- it's all private the, land. Everything's private land. Which is basically the imperialist project, but I don't know, this seems like a particularly egregious example of it, and I just thought it was worth mentioning. The Hudson's Bay Company and how we always think of Canada as this more socialist country, but mm -hmm. Hudson's Bay shows how we are in many ways, just like our southern counterpart, we still had business oriented on the mind. Oh yeah, especially at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, like you were saying, like today you can make the argument that certain things are different, especially with Medicare and so on and so forth. But at the time, especially in its beginning, and again, it it might have been couched in this idea that you know, oh, we're we're expanding west to stop the American expansion north. But the underlying idea of it was definitely this: the fact of hey, no, we, wanna, we want to be able to exploit this territory, not the Americans, right? Instead of the Americans. And that's a lot of what made Canada the modern country that it is today, absolutely, right? So the final thing that I want to bring up is the Red River Settlement, right? And Ooh. the Red River Settlement is an interesting case study, not only because it's the setting for the novel that we're going to be talking about later, but because to me, it indicates everything it summarizes as a concept, right? Everything that I've been talking about uh, since the beginning, right? And it also sets the groundwork for things to come post-Confederation because this specific settlement is going to be the focus of one of the most important conflicts in Canadian history. And like, it's going to have an, a direct impact on the creation of Manitoba. So I want to bring this up as a kind of way to bring all these elements together before moving on to the actual literature. So the Red River Settlement was established in 1812 by a certain Lord Selkirk. Uh, sorry, Earl of Selkirk, not Lord. He was a Lord, but he was an Earl Selkirk. <laughs> well, isn't an Earl a Lord? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so Lord Selkirk, it doesn't matter. He's, he's a dead, British it doesn't douche. matter. <laughs> so a British lord, a British deuce, they're all the same. So Thomas Douglas, so Lord Selkirk, ba basically bought this region for settlement from the Hudson's Bay Company, thus enforcing the idea that it was private property uh, that could just be bought and sold at will. Uh, he would eventually officially gain control of the colony in 1812. And in 1811, he was basically granted by the Hudson, uh, sorry, in 1810, he was, uh, he took control. In 1811, mm -hmm. he was granted 
granted 300,000 square kilometers of land at the, at the confluence of the Assiniboia and Red Rivers in modern day Manitoba. And with this land, he would basically bring a bunch of Scotch settlers, Scottish settlers, and Scotch. He just brought a bunch of Scotch. <laughs> uh, you've never heard that term, Scotch settlers or Scotch uh, Scotchman? I know, I know. Scotsman, okay. isn't it? I, I've, I, I've heard both. I've heard Scotsman and Scotch. Huh. Um, I could be wrong on that one also. Eh. Eh. It's not like we have that many Scottish listeners. <laughs> That's a quick way to get canceled on Twitter. <laughs> it's fine. I constantly say it. Please cancel us. It's fine. Basically, Selkirk would become the governor of this area and he would incite a lot of settlement, uh, namely from Scottish uh, people who were seeking, as we've often seen in Canadian history, better opportunity here in Canada and in the United States. Now, what's really interesting about the Red River Settlement is not just the fact that it represents the private property of the Hudson's Bay Company, right? That it was bought mm -hmm. and sold and that it simultaneously represents private enterprise and settlement as the Hudson's Bay Company does, but because it also demonstrates the conflicts that the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company traders had at the time, right? Because the Red River Settlement in 1812, 13, 14 would basically go through a series of literal armed conflicts between the two companies, mm -hmm. right? Because the Hudson's Bay Company had basically given off a plot of land that, uh, that was basically in the way of the Northwest Company trading route. <laughs> so the Northwest Company was like, hey, that's bullshit. You're stopping me from doing business properly. And so they would straight up continuously force people to leave the settlement, Mm -hmm. Right. And they would constantly straight up go to blows with some of the local uh, traders and local farmers and freemen that were in the area. Right. So for the longest time, um, the, the Red River settlement as a stand in for the Hudson's Bay Company as a whole was extremely tenuous. Right. And it's really only once the Northwest Company was bought by the Hudson's Bay Company that this would just uh, go by the wayside because obviously it wasn't a problem anymore. <laughs> now, something that we should mention, and that still kind of cap us off, and it will also relate to something that we're going to be talking about in the novel, is that the Red River Settlement was located in an area that was home to what we know as the Métis. We, I think we've talked about them on the show before, are basically the product of French colonizers and indigenous populations. And it created what was called for a long time a quote-unquote half-breed, right, or mixed-race person. Now, the Métis are considered to have a culture on their own and consider themselves to be uh, not quite indigenous, not quite European. They have their own uh, language, they have their own culture, and this Red River settlement appears on their Land. I'm opening this up because while for the focus, uh, for the purpose of our episode here, we're focusing on the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company, this is going to become the site of a different kind of territorial dispute later when the famous Métis leader, Louis Riel, would stage a rebellion or sometimes it's called a straight up revolution near Red River. We're talking decades down the road here, but when it comes time to buy the Hudson's Bay Company, right, the, or the Hudson's Bay Company territory, suddenly we have to think about, so, which again, utterly baffling because how could we not think of it uh, already? We have to think about these indigenous populations. And Louis Riel is going to be one of the major figures that's going to actively resist the Confederation project. Bum, um, bum, bum. And basically this is where it starts, is here. <laughs> Um, at the foundation of the Red River Settlement and the actual actions of the Hudson's Bay Company. Okay, cool. I just thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> Do it. Bring up whatever makes you happy. This does make me happy in some sense. It makes me happy to bring it up. It doesn't make me happy that it happened. Because why would it? Anyway. Makes um, good content, though. <laughs> so... Uh, was there anything that you wanted to mention just to kind of cap it all off before we actually get into the literature? I like their blankets. Interesting. Okay. What do you like about their blankets? They're just really soft and well-made. And the mm. color scheme is nice. You can see, honestly, the evolution of the and the persistence of the Hudson's Bay Company is something I find very comforting. How so? It's just one of those, it's just the way that, you know, you, there's a, the bay is always going to be open. You're always going to get your tires done a Canadian tire. 
Okay. It's just it's just the way Canada is. One of those functionally Canadian things. Okay. So it's just like the idea that it's so consistently there is comforting to you. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can see that. It's just one of those things that's consistently ingrained as a symbol of who we are now, you know? Yeah. In the same Absolutely. way of hockey is and all that. Hmm. Do you think? I don't know how well known the Bay is known internationally, right? I would imagine so. I don't know. Probably not super well known. Canadian companies have a very hard time getting outside of Canada, which is what makes them so quintessentially Canadian. I can understand that. Yeah, absolutely. Canadian Tire tried to put new, like more Canadian tires in the States. Yeah. They started in Texas for whatever reason, and that failed horribly. <laughs> it's just one of those things where like Canadian companies create such a loyalty to their national identity mm-hmm. that they can't go anywhere else. But by that same token, now it makes it hard for those companies to now invade. It's like when Target tried to come to Canada, and it just... Yeah. Or wasn't it Rogers that tried to buy re- recently, this is more Quebec local, uh, Cogeco? It's like a telemar- uh, tele a telecommunications company uh, but it made like a really big thing because people were like no yeah <laughs> for once that we have like a well in this case local relatively local telecommunications company no we're not gonna buy it even if it is for millions of dollars go away <laughs> it, it, yeah it, i can understand that uh reaction mm. it's just one, i don't know it's one of those things that's like nice to have Anyway, so literature, literature. So today, the book that we're going to specifically be talking about, and again, we're going to be talking more about what it represents, right? Why a boy's novel, a boy's adventure novel, right? And less about the actual story, because the story itself is interesting when we can delve into some of the choices that the author makes. But there's less of a literary analysis to do than maybe some of the other books that we've done, right? I think, Mm -hmm. again, this is one of those cases where the book itself represents something much larger uh, than uh, than just the sum of its parts. Oh, for sure. So today we're going to be talking about a book that was published in 1856 called Snowflakes and Sunbeams, or The Young Fur Traders, A Tale of the Far North. Yes, fur traders. It is the entire title. Um... (laughs) So it was written actually by a Scottish writer named R.M. Ballantyne, who was born in Scotland in Edinburgh to a family of printers and publishers who would ultimately actually basically go to the brink of financial ruin because of their massive investments into the career of Sir Walter Scott, who was a notoriously bad businessman and he lost all his money and so therefore so did they. Because of these financial difficulties, Ballantyne himself had about two years of formal schooling before he then couldn't pay for it anymore. And it's at that moment that at the age of 16, Ballantyne would travel to Canada and join the HBC as a clerk. So he would actually travel around many of the outposts in the Hudson's Bay Company for about five years, right? From 1841 to 1845, right? Um, And he would eventually in 1846 be transferred on the St. Lawrence, uh, into the St. Lawrence District, and he would be namely posted in Setzil and Tadoussac. And he would basically do this until 1847 when he would just go home. So he spends about six years in total as a worker for the Hudson's Bay Company in various administrative tasks. This, his experience as a Hudson's Bay Company clerk would actually form the foundation of his very first novel, which was basically just called Hudson's Bay Company, right? It was, and all it was, was a compilation, more or less, of his uh, letters that he wrote to his mother. That's pretty much the entire book. It's uh, super boring. <laughs> no, that's great. That that's that's awesome. Oh yeah, you want to read it? No. Okay. I, I was gonna propose. Why don't we just do an entire episode where we read every single letter? <laughs> oh God. Can you imagine how boring that would be? Yes. Yes, actually, I can. But um, yeah. So yeah, in 1856, he would actually use these same experiences again and write the novel that we're talking about today, which for the sake of brevity or 
just, you know, sanity. We're either going to call Snowflakes and Sunbeams or the Young Fur Traders. We're not going to say the entire title of Snowflakes and Sunbeams, the Young Fur Traders, A Tale of the Far North, Mm -hmm. because fuck that. Um, (laughs) And basically he would spend most of his career writing similar adventure novels for boys, right? This one would be really uh, quite successful and he would actually make a career out of it. And he is considered, and we'll get into this, one of the pioneers of the, uh, uh, the boys adventure novel, right? This precedes works like Treasure Island, for example. Um, so I think there's something very interesting about the fact that this came out of, um, a period in his life where he worked for the Hudson's Bay company. And that's kind of the impetus behind the episode. What I find is like, why, why this kind of book of all things, right? Um, Why a boy's adventure? Mm -hmm. Um, so just a quick overview of what the actual book entails. As we said, it's children's adventure. It's boys adventure specifically. Um, And we'll get into the details as to what the differences are later. And the story is basically that of uh, a trapper, right? And the hard life he lives in the early 1800s. Um, So we basically follow the life of a boy named Charlie Kennedy, who lives in the Red River settlement alongside uh, Scotsmen, Mm -hmm. French Canadian settlers, and natives, although the natives barely get any play aside from a mention at the beginning (laughs) and i there's one chapter i think that focuses on them specifically or like charlie's interaction with them yeah chapter 14 is the indian camp the new outpost and charlie sent on a mission to the indians like that's pretty much it (laughs) that's the rest is basically just his adventures learning how to be a canadian trapper in the canadian wilderness cool that's and pretty much like that's the entire book is chapter by chapter he goes on a different adventure so for example um you know you get uh chapter two is the old fur trader endeavors to fix his son's flint or you know spring and the voyagers chapter eight farewell to kate departure of the brigade and charlie becomes a voyageur chapter 18 the walk continued frozen toes and an encampment in the snow like just these little variety slices of life exactly right and And that's that's pretty much it that's what boyhood like these novels of boyhood honestly are a lot of the time they're just a series of events there's not usually a long overarching plot there's just one adventure after another yeah absolutely part of that i think is because of the way in which um the way in which novels were published at the time. Often they were published in sections, not as a huge uh, cohesive brick. So they were often published in magazines up until the Second World War, right? Things. I also <laughs> think that's also just childhood. Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if it was just you, but when I was a kid growing up, like I was constantly going on like a series of adventures, you know, you pick one up, then you throw it away. Yeah, there's absolutely no way that I ever conceived of my life as like an ongoing thing. <laughs> It was, mm-hmm. it was exactly that. It was like, okay, today I'm going to be playing in the backyard and what are the wild adventures that I'm going to go on in my mind and in that tree over there? Like, that's it. It's super simple. And uh, yeah, it's exactly that. It's slice of life. I think you really hit the nail on the head with that one. Slice of life, well, also with a dose of reality. The most famous book on boyhood is Huck Finn. Yeah. I think I can safely say if it's not the most, it's up there. Yeah, and, and that takes that imaginative boyhood adventures, but then makes them all real. Like all the things really happen to Huck Finn, mm-hmm. which is Absolutely. all part of its own stories and themes. And I think that's kind of the same with what we got here with sunbeams and snowflakes. Yeah, in that he is being sent on like actual adventures, and I think that's a lot of the time these novels are trying to do. They're trying to nail down the reality and of feeling of boyhood. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, Just on the level of language, I think also that that's true. Just the way it's written. If you, if you read it now, like it's available for free online, I'll link it in the description as always, but you know, just reading it as it is, it might not appear to be what you'd expect from a boyhood novel because 
that the language to some people today would be like, this almost sounds like a, a novel for adults, right? So for example, as Charlie gave utterance to his unalterable resolution, he rose from the bit of blue ice and taking Kate by the hand, led her over the frozen river, climbed up the bank on the opposite side, an operation of some difficulty owing to the snow, which had been drifted so deeply during a late storm that the usual track was almost obliterated and turning mm -hmm. into a path that lost itself among the willows, they speedily disappeared. That was one sentence, by the way. <laughs> one sentence. Right. So, but just the, I, I think this, this is a passage, right, that I kind of took at random uh, just now looking at the book, but I think it represents, right, it might seem complex, right? It's a long sentence. There are some words that might not be uh, understood by a boyhood audience or a, a relatively young childhood audience, but you get the feeling of what they're going for, this kind of sense of adventure and simplicity that I think a lot of these boyhood novels represent. Just taking a girl by the hand and running in the snow. That's basically what he's describing here. Right? Right. And that's the adventure. <laughs> that's part of the adventure here. That's um, my, that was my adventure. Yeah, still my adventure. I'm planning on doing that this winter, just grabbing my, <laughs> my partner by the hand and just running through the snow. <laughs> Have you ever tried to run through deep snow, though? It's like... Oh, it's, it's hell. I hate God. walking through snow that's <laughs> plowed. I can't, I don't, I don't even. I, Just you know. Canadian things. <laughs> but I think you're, you're absolutely right with, uh, with what you're saying. Yeah. I noted down here, and I think this might take us into uh, other topics, right? This is a world in which children are allowed to grow, right? Right. Far from the quote unquote civilized rigidness of British colonies. It's a world that's in flux, especially if we consider it within the framework of the HBC. It's something that's untamed, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? And so if ever there's a time where you get to experience the harshness of life and just kind of be yourself for a minute, it's in this kind of setting where you can seem to be blissfully unaware of the harsh realities that await you in the colonies, for example, in the Canadas, or even blissfully unaware of the fur trade itself, because it was a harsh reality for a lot of people, right? It's cold, it's long nights, you have actually a lot of physical labor to do, um, you risked your life. And through the, through the lens of a childhood novel, you don't really have to pay attention to a lot of this. And you can just grow in this setting that's very idyllic in a sense, but still teaches a valuable lesson. Um, or at least within the context of Victorian literature. Yeah, it, it, I guess like the best way to kind of sum this up before we actually get into discussion questions about this is it's kind of like a rite of passage. That's boyhood for you. And it's, a, it's an interesting thing going forward, we've been saying boyhood and how we're going to have to change these novels. Mm, interesting. And in, based on gender dynamics, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, before we get too far ahead, do you want to explain the difference between like a boyhood novel and a children's novel? Because you mentioned that at the start, and I think it's an interesting point to raise. These novels of boyhood often involve, I mean, most children's novels are coming of age stories. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, say, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, other famous children's novels, they actually involved fantasy elements in them, right? Like yep. they involve things that are outside the norm. They are actual fantasy. Boyhood is about a mad. It's about the real in many ways. Again, taking the big example of Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, but actually they don't. They don't fight pretend pirates. They fight actual bandits. <laughs> that's true. Like that's something that actually happens in the novel, and you scratch your head and you go, "What?" Yep. Huck Finn literally shares a boat with an escaped slave and two con men. Yeah. There's Absolutely. nothing fake or pretend about what's going on. Whereas like traditional children's literature, it's a bit more free flowing. The metaphor is a bit more, you know, they're the anxieties of growing up are played more as a metaphor, mm -hmm. like Absolutely. Peter Pan literally is. Yes. Interesting. So if I guess if I had to make a distinction, children's literature is about coming to terms with growing up, but boyhood literature is growing up. Obviously, right around the same time, you saw the emergence of girl novels. Yeah, right? girlhood, which is, I must marry rich, must find a good man in high society. Absolutely. If you want a good example, it's not specifically girlhood, no uh, girlhood novels, but a good example of the kind of mentality that we're working with, Jane Austen novels. Mm -hmm. right? Jane Austen novels, however, were just 
ironic to the max, right? She, she, she was just a savage in that sense. A lot of people don't really catch the irony today, but that's basically what it was. Oh, oh Jane, 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 you bloody legend. But you know, it's that kind of idea that girlhood novels took very seriously, right? Whereas Jane Austen uh, was a bit more tongue in cheek with it. Just take that, but make it serious, or at least for girls to teach them the quote unquote proper way of being a girl and what uh, awaits you for society. Being a girl. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, So yeah, and that's pretty much what you get. (laughs) I think it would be interesting to kind of delve deeper into this idea of what does the HBC itself or the Hudson's Bay Company or its holdings in Rupert's land represent for the imagination? Right. It, this might seem like a broad question, but I think it's a relevant one to ask because, you know, the, the, this is, a, we're talking about a novel that was specifically influenced by time within the Hudson's Bay Company, right? So it clearly had an impact on Ballantyne's imagination. I'm curious what your thoughts are as to why this experience in and of itself would kind of bring out this ostensibly at the time new genre for Ballantyne. It's... It, it, the HPC, how do I say this? It, it, in many ways, it was an uncontrolled land. Yeah. Like, yeah, they owned it, but it, there was private land. There was no, it's not the same rules and regulations that we are used to working and living with. Combine that with the fact that it's still the new world and you've got this wide open, there's so much space for imagination. There's so much space to create your own adventure. Yeah, absolutely. And Uh, To to kind of add to this idea, right, I think there's also something to be said about the fact that, you know, just kind of taking that same idea that you were saying and pushing it further, the HBC, I think, is one of the final, final frontiers, right, as it it was understood at the time. That and, like, Africa kind of thing, Uh, because they were, uh, European powers were entering the heart of Africa right around this time also. And... You know, you saw similar types of adventure novels appear with an African setting right around that time as well. There's something to be said, however, with the HBC is that it was an ocean away, right? There was literally no land access for a lot of the European writers like Ballantyne was to, uh, to access this place. You had mm-hmm. to travel by sea. You had to actually not only travel by sea, which is already a huge endeavor, but get into what you considered to be civilization at the time with the colonies in Eastern Canada. And then you reach this final frontier. It kind of has this double (laughs) layer of- So uh, many final frontiers. Yeah, right? But I I think that's extremely relevant, right? Um, You know, it's, whereas for the African or Asian continents from a European perspective, right? that, That they're writing, you know, you could- more easily access it, right? Without having to travel for weeks by a boat and then by sled and then by whatever, by boat and again to reach certain rivers. It was ostensibly more accessible, although not really. But Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think my point stands. To relate it back to boyhood novels as novels about growing up, there's something I think that we can relate it back to is the rhetoric that the HBC elicited from Canadian officials, from British officials, that it was eventually to be a colony, right? right? I think that's a very important thing for Ballantyne when he's writing, right? Is that the boys that are in that, it's like Charlie Kennedy, when he's running around and having his adventures in, um, in, uh, near, in and around the Red River settlement as a trader, right? mm-hmm. he's paralleling the growing up that the Hudson's Bay Company and the Rupert Land Territory is going through in order to become a fully-fledged area for settlement and civilization. At the time when Ballantyne was writing, they're using it just for trade, but with the understanding that given enough settlers, it'll become like (laughs) lower Just put enough settlers, it'll be fine. But that's, that, that's the thing, right? Is that as soon as Canada buys the land, that's exactly what you hear about it. Okay, you've you've you spent your time as a trading post. Now you can actually be a conduit for all these Eastern European settlers that are going to be arriving and that we're encouraging. You can actually become a an adult and graduate, so to speak, and mature into becoming a province. Right. I'm I'm extrapolating a bit here because they didn't use specifically that language, but that that kind of rhetoric and that kind of idea about the prairies was extremely present. And I think that's, I don't think that's a coincidence here when we're talking about, uh, 
the emergence of the boyhood novel and uh, well, in this case, specifically the HBC, but just newly explored lands in general. Right. You got to wonder how much they were really thinking they would gain independence as their own nation state as a company. Um, Where would the line get drawn? I think at first, I, I, I think at first they were operating very much under the idea that like, no, we're currently a private enterprise that's whose entire goal and mandate is to, mm-hmm. you know, produce beaver pelts for aristocracy in Britain in this case. But... You know, I think it was most certainly a plan eventually was to industrialize and quote unquote civilize a lot of these places. I just think that's, even if it's not explicitly stated or thought of, I think that's just part of the imperial plan at the time. (laughs) I don't think you can dissociate it. I find it interesting also, right? Kind of, again, going off of this idea, this is just a thought that I was having is that I find it interesting that Ballantyne of all people would pioneer the idea of children, in this case, boys having adventures of their own, right? Away from the guidance and gaze of adults, right? And just how that parallels a lot of the HBC traders, right? A lot of the time, as I was mentioning, the governor and the committee were overseas. No one was actually there to see. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, again, that kind of lends credence, I think, to my, uh, to my understanding, at least, of the, the Hudson's Bay Company as this place that's, even if uh, that's implicitly understood as eventually going to grow into something uh, something else, something supposedly greater than itself. Mm-hmm. It's it's going through its own little rite of passage to show that it can actually act independently, that pe- the people that are there can actually be proper British citizens, so to speak, and then we can make it a proper colony. Do you think that this genre, defined as broadly as you want it, exists in without the type of world in which the HBC exists? Right, this world in which these final frontiers of mysterious. Did you think that? Wait, that's... which genre? Do you mean boyhood or? Yeah, like boyhood or just children, whether it's boy or girlhood novels. In this case, boyhood, I guess, because they're like. Do you think that it Ballantyne would have written the kind of novel that he wrote if the HBC didn't exist, or if this kind of idea of society didn't exist, so to speak? Right. It's a bit yeah. weird to say like this if question, but I think it's a relevant one to ask. I think he still would have, again, if he's still there living as living in the family of hunters slash trappers for whatever reason, he'll write the novel. Right. The experiences will still be there. They'll just be different. Interesting. Yeah. You, I, 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 don't, I don't know if you need like, again, Twain Dickens wrote Boyhood. He wrote Great Expectations in urban London or like countryside London, countryside England. Sorry. Right. That's true. You can kind of always find this niche in which people can grow. It's always going to be tales of how we grow up and how we do it. It's just going to be different for who it is and what setting it is. But we're always going to have a story to tell of how we grew up. It's funny because, again, that kind of comes back to this idea that you were saying of the Hudson's Bay Company being so tied to Canada. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to imagine a Canada in which this didn't happen. Um, mostly because it did happen, so it's very hard to say that it didn't happen. But <laughs> in the sense of, you know, what would have Canada looked like if we hadn't gone through this rite of passage? It would have looked very different, or at least it would have gone through a radically different set of circumstances, probably. Mm-hmm. So I find it, I, I find your choice of saying, like, we're going on our own adventures particularly enlightening in this case. To That's say what I aim that to do, enlighten everybody. You exist for my own edification. Mm-hmm. I exist <laughs> as your personal Buddha. <laughs> So are you going to meditate under a maple tree for 90 days until how long, however long the Buddha meditated until he achieved enlightenment? Yes, but I'm going to do it in my apartment with the air conditioning on. Fair enough. It's very hot in Montreal today when we're recording. <laughs> I'll just transplant a tree. Oh, interesting. There was something that I wanted to bring up also. This idea of relating this to the survival idea that is often associated with Canada. This was one of the criticisms it was a critical analysis of uh, snowflakes and sunbeams which there aren't a lot of which i'm kind of surprised that there aren't more than that Mm. there's a lot of it that concerns masculinity which we can touch upon in uh this novel or just the idea of you know uh trading and growing up as a child but there's aside from that there's very little uh like actual critical engagement with the with the book which 
might be an interesting thing to actually pursue. But, you know, one of the foundational ideas for a lot of people about Canada is this relation to survival. Right? In nature. Right, exactly. Survival, survival in nature. nature. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. The, the classic example was brought up by Northrop Fry and later his student, Margaret Atwood, who wrote literally a book called Survival, which is a literary analysis of the ways in which people comprehend their relation to Canada as surviving something. So it's interesting to me that this doesn't seem to be much of a concern in this case. To me, it would have been an obvious addition right? Um, you know, you learn to survive in the wilderness, right? In this rough and tumble neighborhood. And maybe that's just my modern vision of it is this idea that you're a young trader, you want to actually learn the ropes and maybe your path in this story is to learn how to survive. To me, it would have almost been a perfect way in which to approach this theme, but that mm -hmm. doesn't really seem to be the case with Snowflakes and Sunbeams. Charlie just goes through the motions, right? I don't know if you had any thoughts about this idea of survival and why Ballantyne might not have put it in. I guess it was just an artistic choice, but that's just- In the, the tale he's trying to tell, survival would be a moot point. It's just part of the landscape. So it would be redundant to talk about survival. Mm, interesting. It's like, the same it's way. Huck, yeah, okay. it's the same way in Huck Finn. The talk there, there's more talk about survival because he's in a nice little town. Right. Okay. Like or Great Expectations, even you know, talk about how Pip survives because there's the it makes the tension. It's not something he'd be used to. Growing up is part of growing up is challenging things that are outside of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So I'm assuming for some beams and snowflakes, survival is already something he's used to. Survival is already in the comfort zone. Right. Or you can even take it a kind of a step further, right? This idea of self-reliance, mm -hmm. right? Or coming to terms with that land, I think probably relates more to this idea of survival that I maybe gave it credit for, right? Actually accepting that this is like a really rough mm -hmm. land rather than trying to manipulate it. Yeah, I, I would say it's probably a, an actual uh, response, probably to this idea of survival, even if it is unconscious or redundant, as you say. Mm -hmm. Interesting. One of the things that I want to, and it's it's going to be a, a bit of a shorter episode. I just thought it was an interesting way to bring up the idea of the Hudson's Bay Company, right, as a concept. You know, is the idea that this is a book that is addressed for such a mass audience of boys right? Mm -hmm. This is intended for mass consumption, which by the way, we can make some interesting parallels to the fact that the Hudson's Bay company itself was an, was also just a vehicle for mass consumption of beaver trades, uh, of beaver mm -hmm. fur. So beaver I think fur. that's an interesting parallel to bring up, by the way, <laughs> if I don't know if you had any thoughts about that one, but I thought that, I think that's very interesting. But you know, this book is intended for a mass audience, a mass uh, readership, right? Especially mm -hmm. a young and very malleable that you can actually tell a lot of things to and they'll believe. Do you think that Ballantyne might, even if unconsciously, right, had had an intention behind this novel, beyond just the fact of, you know, we want to teach boys how to become real men that know how to live in nature and, you know, work the axe and work hard as real men do. Sure, there was. These, these books always have undercurrents of what the author is actually trying to talk about. Mm -hmm. Huck Finn was about slavery and racism in the Deep South and an antebellum world. Good Expectations was about the differences in society and class and social change. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if we looked at this one, we'd probably see something along the lines of the relations of the First Nations of Canadians, or more probably something along the lines of the capitalistic, the monopoly, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, just going off of that first idea that you were mentioning right, right at the beginning of the book, he says, in the very center of the great continent of North America, far removed from the abodes of civilized men, and about 20 mm -hmm. miles to the south of Lake Winnipeg, exists a colony composed of Indian Scotman, Scotsmen and French Canadians, which is known as the Red River Settlement. It differs from most colonies in more respects than one. The chief differences being that whereas other colonies cluster on the seacoast, this one lies many hundreds of miles in the interior of the country. Mm -hmm. It's surrounded by a wilderness. 
other colonies acting on the golden rule export their produce in return for goods imported. This of Red River exports a large quantity and exports nothing. I think this kind of comes back to what you, you were saying, right? This idea of you know, just finding, even if it's not necessarily explicit, it's kind of underlying current that, you know, they're, the, the basic idea of the book is finding itself, right? This colony doesn't actually produce much or exports much. It just exists. It doesn't actually, uh, as they would understand it, again, as you were saying, like in this capitalistic mindset, uh, produce anything of value. Um, <laughs> right, but that's what it is, right? Um, and so, and of course, as you were saying, right, uh, probably the, its relation to the natives is completely ignored, right? It's just mm -hmm. wilderness around it. It doesn't, you know, they're, they're there, but also everything around it is wilderness, which again can kind of be kind of related back to how a lot of the British saw the natives, not only as non-existent, but also just as this, this monolithic swath, if you will, mm -hmm. right? By the way, we're not talking about the natives today because I want to address them individually as actual nations as we're going along, right? And as Canada is going to move west, I think it would be interesting to actually talk individually about the different nations that they encounter. So that's why we're not talking about them today, um, right. by the way, because not only would it be too long, there are hundreds of them, but just for that very reason. I guess in a sense, right, would you almost put this, and this can be kind of like a concluding idea, right? Would you almost put this into the category of almost propaganda, kind of a way to instill certain values in children? And if it wasn't sponsored by a government or a private institution, I wouldn't call it propaganda. I mean, we've called other things propaganda before. Yeah, but all all books and all good literature is trying to instill some sort of moral values in you. That's true. Saying that a book or a tale is instilling some sort of values or lesson. True. But for this case, it's it would almost be for the specific benefit of the Hudson's Bay Company, right? You In the past, we've called, for example, Alexander McLaughlin and Joseph Howe, we've called their poetry bordering on that. Uh, to, we, we've named their poetry as bordering on that, right? Very much encouraging people to come to Upper Canada and settle, right? In this case, you can kind of shift it a bit and say like, you're putting, you're telling these children that, hey, life within the Hudson's Bay Company as a fur trader is easy in a sense, or it's fun in which you can have all kinds of wonderful adventures. And yes, they get into a couple of scrapes, but that's just boys, what boys do, right? I don't I know. It, I, I, I think I, as a book of boyhood, I don't know if that, if that makes it, I don't know if that, for me, books of boyhood and all that, they're less, they become less propaganda specific because they're targeting children. That's interesting. Okay. The lessons and the morals really have to like be hard hitting anyway, you know? I can understand that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In children's literature, you're going to be instilling morals more so than any other literature. You're going to be trying to teach lessons harder mm. and faster. Well, you know, we've talked about this kind of idea before. So I was like, well, mm -hmm. yeah, what do we make of this? <laughs> so I guess, again, much shorter episode. It was a bit more concise, but by and large, what do you make of this kind of literature, just kind of as a concluding thought, what do you make of this literature within the grand scheme of Canadian literature and as it relates to the Hudson's Bay Company? Do you have any final thoughts as to its place or its importance or lack thereof? I'd say there's a, I don't know, because this is the first time I'm ever hearing of it. I don't know uh, if it, you, you've ever heard much of it or if it got taught in schools or something. No, not at all. It's not really taught in schools, at least as I've as I've seen it. Um, and the critical engagement with it is mostly in the sense of like Ballantyne himself is a pioneer in the children's literary genre mm -hmm. to talk about boyhood. I don't know. I don't know if it's, I don't see if it's very important or influential seeing as how it just sort of got forgotten. Interesting. But haven't most of our books been forgotten that we talk about on this show? Well, yeah, that's my, that's my total view of Canadian literature. It's not very <laughs> influential and it doesn't have much of a presence. I mean, I, I, I would say it had... I would reinforce the idea that it had an influence in its own time, if Probably. not today, right? Because today, by and large, I don't think boyhood <laughs> novels are that in, are that popular anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like after the Hardy Boys, like can you really name a modern boyhood novel or something like that? I don't feel they're quite popular anymore. Mm. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> great, great input there. Hmm. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I feel like in its own time, it's 
it's important to recognize that it kind of pioneered a genre and that to me it perfectly represents the mindset of Victorian society and how it viewed the potential of masculinity as something that instilled good, hardworking values and, you know, men as being these tough and nature-driven workers, right? That mm -hmm. did this for the benefit of empire. Um, and I think that it's not a coincidence that it coincides along with the HBC. So I thought it was interesting to bring up again, Probably not very relevant today, but I think it's definitely worthy of mention, not only as a first on the grand scheme of literary genres, uh, that it would be influenced by a Canadian uh, setting, if not an actual Canadian, because he only lived here for like six years. He was a temporary Canadian, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's it's worthy of mention and definitely, if if you don't if if you don't feel like reading it, at least like peruse it and understand where it comes from. Right. And you'll get a good sense of what society was at the time. Society. All right. Well, with that rather short episode out of the way. Was it really that short compared to our other ones? I don't know. I felt like I didn't talk a lot or maybe I talked too much and you know, whatever. <laughs> it'll, it'll be what it is. It is what it'll be. Why don't you take us home, Mac? Take me home. <laughs> Got your room. West Virginia, Mountain Mama, take me home. I love Open that your voice was so high pitched there for a minute that your mic cut out. Uh, I need a nap. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> Send us money through FedEx. <laughs> oh, okay. PayPal, Interact, Patreon, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. our OnlyFans page, nice. buying through affiliate links. Do you want me to do it? Sure. Pay what we're worth. Pay what you believe we're worth. <laughs> Leave a review on iTunes. Share it with your friends. Join us on Facebook and Twitter. Send us emails. Yeah, I think that pretty much covered it. <laughs> Engagement, everyone. <laughs> Engage! So yeah, like we said at the beginning, if you want, uh, especially on Patreon, it's a great way to support us. You can get extra episodes that are led by Mac through Pop Canada and ad-free or full-length episodes. You gotta make like a character in a Jane Austen novel and get engaged. Hell yeah. <laughs> what a way to cap off. Thank you everyone for listening and we'll see you next time on another rousing episode of Where In Mac might be either a chaotic force or express his disapproval of a novel with a simple hmm. hmm. <laughs> That's the kind of quality content you can expect. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>